work out the way we thought it was going to work out. Amen. And so we are so excited that we are able to do exa even do what we had planned to do today. Even though the lights may be out at the church, that's okay. But we still going to get the word of God today. Amen. 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 And so come on, we're talking because we want to invite you to just we given a few minutes. We want you to in come on in. Amen. Glory to God. We're going to pray. We want to set the atmosphere, you know, for God just to have his way, to say what he wants to say in the, in the, to us today. Amen. Mm, amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And, and many of you already know, and those of you that don't, we are going to inform you today. And we realize that many of you are watching from out of state, uh, but uh, God still has a word that's going to catapult you into the, another level of his, his purpose for your life. And, you know, Mayor Broom, the mayor of Baton Rouge, uh, is going to be ministering the word of God for us this morning. And, uh, she ministered at our church several years ago when we were on Nicholson Drive, and she brought a word that transformed our lives. And I wanted, as a matter of fact, it was imperative. I had a, 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 there was something in my spirit that said she had a word for us this morning. Uh, you can see the thread of God throughout her life, you know, all the way from we've been knowing her for many, many years. And you can see the thread of God through her political life, through her life of faith. And so that's what we need. We need men and, and women of God. Of integrity, integrity and faith first, and Glory then become politicians. Hallelujah. So I just Glory thank God for what He's done in her life, and we just want you to be uh, uh, ready and ready uh, to receive from the Holy Ghost. Come expecting, because God has a word, Glory. and we thank God for His word. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen, Glory amen, to God. amen. And before we release her today, we're just going to pray, and we just want to pray for people that was affected. You know, with the hurricane, and we know realize that a lot of people still lights are still out and everything like that. We just want to pray, amen, yeah, because amen. we have to realize that you know, God blessed Baton Rouge once again. Mm, Glory to God. We, we, we can't take that from God, you know. Mm. And even though we may not have some people, may not have lights, that's nothing to complain about what it could have been. Mm. Glory to God, and we just want to give God the praise you, and the, his Jesus. keeping power that he keeps. Keeping us. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And I want you to know that uh, um, this is a God-ordained moment. Uh, God has ordained uh, 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 the Honorable Mayor Bloom to be in the position she's in. And, of course, we know as a church we pray for her constantly, just like we pray for all leaders. But God is about to explode in this city and in your life. Thank you, Jesus. All I need you to do is just come expect and say, God. Man can't give me what I need, but you can't. Holy Spirit, I'm depending on you. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus. Father God, we just thank you. Come on, as always, you know, I encourage you, you just lift up your hands. Oh, thank Glory you, to God, Jesus. Father. That's a thank sign you, that we're just surrendering yes, to you, Lord, Lord God. Yes. And Father God, we just thank you, Lord God, it's for this beautiful anointing, day, Lord God. Thank we you, Lord. Thank, you, Lord. thank you, Lord God. This is the day that you made, Lord yes, God, and we're going to rejoice, thank Lord you, God. God, and we're going to be glad in it, Lord God. Thank Father God, God, we just pray, Lord God, for Louisiana mm. as a whole, Lord God. Thank Father, we thank you, Lord God, that Louisiana is in your hand and no devil in hell can take it out. Thank Father God. God, we thank you for the prayers and the intercession, yes, Lord Lord God, that goes forth, Lord mm. God, for Louisiana, Lord thank God. You, Lord and Father Jesus. God, we've already prayed that Louisiana is yes. going from the bottom to the top yes, in Lord. every area, every Lord God. Area. And Father God, we just thank you, Lord God. We thank, thank you for our governor to meet our mail today, Lord God. Yes. And Father God, I just thank you, Lord God, for the word of God that you placed in our heart. Yes, and Lord Father Jesus. God, we thank you, Lord God, that word mm. of God is going to come forth simplicity with simplicity you, God. and Father God is going to come forth boldly and it's going to come forth accurately and it's going to come forth anointed yes, and Father Lord God Jesus. we just thank you and we praise you and mm -hmm. we just glorify you right now thank Lord you, God, God for what you are going to do yes. on this broadcast yes, today and Father God we give you all the praise all and the we praise. give you all the glory all for the it glory. in Jesus name in Jesus amen. Name. Amen. Amen. amen 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 Hallelujah. glory to God we thank you for tuning in the very next voice you hear is going to be the voice of our Honorable Mayor, Sharon Weston Bloom. Glory to God. Hallelujah.
morning, good morning, good morning. This is the day that the Lord has made and we are rejoicing and we're glad in it. I want to thank uh, Pastor Drumgold and um, Mrs. Drumgold, Sister Drumgold, Minister Drumgold, the Drumgolds for the, allowing uh, me to have this opportunity uh, through Living Word, a wonderful uh, church located in Baton Rouge. And Living Word is one of those churches that certainly makes up the fabric of the faith community in Baton Rouge. And we're so blessed in Baton Rouge that we have a very, very strong community of faith. And uh, this morning, I want to talk about something that has uh, been on my mind um, the prayers have already gone forth, and so I'm asking this morning that you unite your heart with my heart in faith. And also, it is very important this morning, I've been thinking that, you know, don't look at me as your mayor president. Although I certainly have the privilege and I'm very humbled to have that opportunity, but I want you to not allow a title to be an obstruction or a distraction to what God has in store for all of us to hear this morning. Amen? Amen. And so, you know, not long ago, I was reading a book, and in the book, um, the, this phrase kept resonating with me, victorious-minded believer victorious minded believer victorious minded believer and something about that phrase just really caught on and attached itself to me and I decided although I have been a, a believer for decades that victorious minded believer uh, title just really, really stuck with me. And, and now whenever I uh, have an opportunity to share, I use the phrase, we are victorious minded believers. And so that's what I want to focus on this morning, being a victorious minded believer. Well, you may say, well, well Sharon, why, why are you saying victorious minded believer? What a, a believer is a believer. Uh, you know for a fact that there are different levels of spiritual growth. And thank God for those people who have accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, Savior and who are believers. But sometimes we're at different walks and different steps in our faith. You know what I'm talking about. You know, you might have some a brother or sister in the Lord you have your mind set on a vision, a faith, a goal, and maybe their words are not lining up with your vision. They still love you. They're still a believer. But have they embraced the victory that you see as a believer? And so this morning we're going to use as our foundational base to talk about um, a victorious minded believer. We're going to come from Joshua. You all know this passage very well. Uh, Joshua, the sixth chapter is what we're going to start with this morning. And I'm going to read verses 1 through 20. And then we're going to come back and have a robust discussion around being a victorious minded believer. So now the gates of Jericho were tightly shut because the people were afraid of the Israelites. No one was allowed to go out or in. But the Lord said to Joshua, I have given you Jericho, its king and all its strong warriors. You and your fighting men should march around the town once a day for six days. Seven priests will walk ahead of the ark, each carrying a ram's horn, on the seventh day, you are to march around the town seven times with the priests blowing the horns. When you hear the priests give one long blast on the ram's horns, have all the people shout as loud as they can. Then the walls of the town will collapse and the people can charge straight into the town. Verse 6, so Joshua 
called together the priests and said, Take up the Ark of the Lord's Covenant and assign seven priests to walk in front of it, each carrying a ram's horn. Then he gave orders to the people, March around the town and the armed men will lead the way in front of the Ark of the Lord. Verse 8, after Joshua spoke to the people, the seven priests with the ram's horns started marching in the presence of the Lord, blowing the horns as they marched, and the Ark of the Lord's covenant followed behind them. Some of the armed men marched in front of the priests with the horns and some behind the Ark, with the priests continually blowing the horns. Do not shout, do not even talk, Joshua commanded. Not a single word from any of you until I tell you to shout, then shout. So the ark of the Lord was carried around the town once that day, and then everyone returned to spend the night in the camp. Verse 12, Joshua got up early in the next morning, and the priests again carried the ark of the Lord. The seven priests with the ram's horns marched in front of the ark of the Lord, blowing their horns. Again, the armed men marched both in front of the priests with the horns and behind the ark of the Lord. All this time, the priests were blowing their horns. On the second day, they again marched around the town once and returned to the camp. They followed this pattern for six days. On the seventh day, the Israelites got up at dawn and marched around the town as they had done before. But this time, they went around the town seven times. The seventh time around, as the priests sounded the long blast on their horns, Joshua commanded the people, shout. For the Lord has given you the town. Jericho and everything in it must be completely destroyed as an offering to the Lord. Only Rahab, the prostitute, and the others in her house will be spared. For she protected our spies. Verse 18, do not take any of these things set apart for destruction or you yourselves will be completely destroyed. And you will bring trouble on the camp of Israel. Everything made from silver, gold, bronze, or uh, iron is sacred to the Lord and must be brought into his treasury. Finally, verse 20. When the people heard the sound of the ram's horns, they shouted as loud as they could. Suddenly, the walls of Jericho collapsed and the Israelites charged straight into the town and captured it. You know, I felt it was so important to just read that entire passage because I want you to be uh, thinking about it as I share some nuggets from that passage. Uh, first of all, we understand uh, a little bit about Joshua, and, and, and I want to share some things about uh, Joshua. You know, Joshua followed Moses, right? He was the next leader in line after Moses. But there's something you need to know about Joshua. Joshua's leadership style was a little bit different from Moses. But I believe that Joshua understood God's protocol. Now, this is a, this is a foundation, and we're, we're still talking about victorious-minded believers. Joshua understood God's protocol which certainly I think positioned him to be a stellar leader. He didn't try to displace Moses. Let, let me repeat that. Joshua didn't try to displace Moses. He knew that he was a leader, but he respected God's protocol. So he didn't try to displace Moses. You know another example of that in the Bible. David. David was a leader, but he understood God's principles and protocols, and he didn't try to displace Saul, even with all the low-down things Saul tried to do to him. Because he understood God's protocol. And so when we operate out of God's divine protocol, it can serve as an obstruction to us having a victorious life. You know, in this passage, Joshua challenges us to embrace God's promises as we walk in his victory despite adversity. Now, we're living in a season right now where 
it is a lot of adversity going on, whether, whether it's in your personal life or just in the life of a city or a nation. There's a lot of adversity going on. Adversity in conversations, adversity in politics, adversity in health, all kind of challenges spiritually, mentally, financially, socially, all kind of adversity going on. But what we have to remember as victorious-minded believers is that God has already given us the victory in spite of adversity. What we have to remember is that our victory is not in what Sharon Weston Broom can do. My victory is in his victory, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He has made us victorious. And if we embrace his promises, we can walk in victory as victorious-minded believers. So let's talk a little bit about Joshua's victory over Jericho. So if you notice, um, Jericho was a strongly fortified city. In fact, <laughs> if you read this again, and I encourage you to do so, the people couldn't get in and out. They were really fortified. You know, uh, they had a defensive wall of protection up from the Israelites. And if you look at verse 2, it says, But the Lord said to Joshua, I have given you Jericho, its king, and all its strong warriors. And so what God is saying to us in the midst of some challenges, your circumstances, whatever may be going on in your life today, I've already given you the victory. I've already given you the victory over every circumstance, over every situation, just like he told Joshua, I have given you Jericho. But guess what? What God wants us to do which elevates our trust in him is that God wants us to walk it out. Walk it out. God has given us the victory, but it is a process that God has put in place. And I believe that process helps strengthen us as victorious-minded believers. You know, sometimes, I, I, I will tell you, I have certain prayers Sometimes I have an idea of how I want that prayer answered. And it is a faith-filled prayer. And sometimes as I go through the process, knowing I already have the victory, I'm like, well, this was not exactly the process I had in mind. But at the end of the day, after I go through the process, I can see how God has made me stronger in my faith how my trust level has elevated, how God's anointing in my life is increased because, because God knows the end at the beginning. He knows everything. He said, look, trust me, I've already given you the victory, but it's a process and I need you to walk it out and it's walking it out in trust and faith that makes the difference. Because if you look at what happened to Joshua, now Joshua was a, a warrior. He was a, he was a commander, right? He was a military guy. And so from a military perspective, you usually have a military strategy. When you go into war, you just don't go in like, oh, we're going to conquer this. You, you have a, the folks in the military, they have a plan. They have it all mapped out. This is how we're going to get into there. This is what we're going to do here. This is what this group is going to do. This is what our land force is going to do, our air. This, it's a strategy, a military strategy. But guess what? The strategy that God gave Joshua, it was not a traditional military strategy. It was not because they didn't have any weapons, any guns, any sword. It, it was not a tradi traditional military strategy strategy. And probably the people on the inside, the citizens of Jericho may have been making fun of Joshua's army as they marched around. But guess what? Joshua 
a great military guy, a great believer, victorious minded. Joshua was not deterred, neither was he detoured. He stayed focused on the command that God told him to do. He stayed focused on the directive that the Lord God told him to do that would give him the already predicted victory over Jericho. Amen? Amen. And so Joshua, in um, um, if you notice, if we go back to Joshua uh, um, verses 2 through 5, you, you will hear certain numbers, right? And one of the numbers that you hear over and over again is what? The number seven, right? He says when you, um, um, seven priests will walk ahead of the ark. On the seventh day, you're going to march seven times with the priest blowing the horns. And we know as believers that seven is the number of what? Completion. Seven is the number of completion. And so what God was really stressing to Joshua is that he must follow the instructions completely if he wanted God's divine intervention in his problem. And you know, sometimes we are seeking God's divine intervention in our situation and in our circumstance, but we have to evaluate ourselves are we following God's instructions? Are we following what he has told us to do? And you might say, well, you know, sometimes I, I, I'm trying to figure it out. I don't know what God is telling me to do. Let me tell you, all you have to do is pick up the word of God. He has an instruction, a directive, a promise for everything. An answer for every situation and circumstance. Certainly as you spend time with the Lord, the Holy Spirit will reveal God's instructions to you. But in case you feel insecure or not confident, go to the Bible. Because guess what? The Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit is not going to contradict the word of God. They're in perfect alignment. Perfect alignment. So let's read uh, verses 6 through uh, 15. Um, so Joshua called together the priests and said, take up the ark of the Lord's covenant. Verse seven, march around the t town. Uh, verse eight, uh, Joshua spoke to the people, uh, the seven priests with the ram's horns marching in the presence of the Lord, blowing the horns and the ark of the Lord's covenant followed behind them. Uh, and then in verse 10, Joshua says, do not shout, do not even talk. Joshua commanded, not a single word from any of you until I tell you when to shout, then shout. You know, sometimes God, God puts people of authority in our lives, whether it is your pastor, whether it is your boss, whether it is your parent. And sometimes they tell us things to do. We don't quite understand what they're telling us to do at the moment. But later on, you see the positive results. How many of us remember when mom and dad would tell us things to do? Give us specific instructions. Don't go over here to this person's house. I want you home by this time. Do this. When you go to school, do the specific instructions. Clean like this. And sometimes we didn't understand, you know, why... You know, my, my, my dad, I'll give my, my dad was a, a very, very, uh, what's the word I should say? He was a man's man and he had certain way he wanted me to do things. He had certain directives and you know, I never will forget, I, I'm giving you a little snapshot into my life. I never will forget once uh, my dad, I wanted to buy a car. And my dad, I went to my dad and I said, listen, uh, would you mind co-signing for me for this car? It's the first car I wanted to purchase. And he said, you know, I'm sorry, but I don't co-sign for anyone. 
even your own daughter. And so, you know, when he said that to me, I thought that was the most horrible thing for a dad to tell me. And I went ahead, I ended up getting the car. That's another whole story. But later on in life, as I became an adult, I understood, as they say, by and by, why my dad said, don't co-sign, and he wasn't even going to co-sign for me. Because for him, that meant that I probably might not be able to pay for it, and that he might get stuck with the bill. And so it was a tough lesson, but he also taught me other directives, you know, about how to handle money. I couldn't understand it then, but later on in life I did. So I use that as an example to say, sometimes we're getting commands, directives. We don't understand it at the moment, but later on, especially, and I have to say this, when these directives are coming from people that love you, that you res there's mutual respect, that you know have your best interest at heart, certainly be prayerful, but at the end of the day, the command is probably leading you on a path, a positive path. So something I want you to consider. And so we're going back to uh, verse 15, uh, which says, On the seventh day, the Israelites got up at dawn, marched around the town as they had done before, but this time they went around the town seven times. And so... Sometimes simple instructions, especially in this case, contradict uh, a firm military strategy. In fact, well, the truth is God was giving Joshua a military strategy. But this strategy was an unorthodox military strategy. It was not like Joshua was used to. And so what God did, he turned the obstacle that stood in their way into a passage leading to fulfillment in their mission. You know, it says that the walls of Jericho fail. The walls of Jericho fail not because Joshua and his men banged on the wall, not because they took one of the, you know, they all got together and tore the wall down like that. They, the wall simply failed because they followed instructions about marching around the wall. They didn't have to touch a thing. That's what you call divine intervention in a situation. And trusting God. Now, you know, um, you have to trust and then you have to act. So, Joshua trusted God with the instructions, and then what did he do? He acted by following those instructions. He acted by following those instructions. You know, um, sometimes God gives people throughout the Bible unorthodox instructions to victory. Remember Naaman, who was cured of leprosy in 2 Kings 5.14? He was told by Elijah to uh, go down and dip himself in the Jordan seven times. There's that number seven again, according to the word. And guess what? He was clean. So for Naaman, initially when he was told to dip in muddy water seven times, that was like, oh, you know, this does not seem like the type of pathway to healing that I had envisioned. But he did it and he was healed. Remember Jesus in John 9, 6? He spat on the ground, made mud with saliva, then spread the mud over the blind man's eyes. And the blind man went, washed his eyes, and guess what? He came back with vision. He had victory. So I share those instances with you because God's ways are not man's ways. And sometimes we think about a way we want to walk something out to get to victory. And God is putting us on a whole different path. But at the end, it brings victory. Amen? And so I want to share also, um, you know, I was thinking about Rahab. This passage is so, has so much in it. Rahab the prostitute was rescued as promised along with her family. Why? 
because she was faithful in protecting God's people. And you know, one of the messages I got out of Rahab's story in protecting God's people, always choose God. You might be wondering, should I do this? Should I do that? Should I do? Always choose God. If you choose God, you can't go wrong. You, you will end up, it maybe end up in the hallmark of faith. Just making a one choice of choosing God. That's what Rahab did. It didn't matter that she was a prostitute, that she had lived a, 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 a certain lifestyle. At the end of the day, she chose God. And she and her family were benefactors because she chose God. Always choose God and God's ways. You know, early on in my Christian walk, and you all remember this too, um, there was the WWJD. What would Jesus do? I think we still need to uh, illuminate that as a standard in our lives now more than ever before. Because there's so many voices trying to give you direction, what to do, etc. And, and you have to always choose God. And then think about what would Jesus do? How would Jesus handle it? What does he say in his word on how to handle a situation? What path would Jesus give me towards victory? If you look throughout scripture, you'll see path after path after path where God has led people to victory by following his will and his ways. And that is what happened to Rahab. So as we look at Joshua, what are some of the keys to the victorious minded believer that we see in this passage? Well, we see obedience. Obedience, obedience, obedience. Obedience is better than sacrifice. And Joshua chose to obey God. And you know what? I, as I read the scripture, I can't think of him even flinching or questioning. He just acted and obeyed. And so a key to us having a victorious lifestyle is we must choose to obey God. You know, there are people um, in our lives, loved ones, people who we know who, who may have certain uh, perspectives, but if the perspectives don't line up with God and his word, then you have to obey God's word. You have to obey God's word. Another key to victory that we find in this passage is that Joshua was God-centered and God-focused. What consumes most of your focus? What consumes your priority? Who is the top priority in your life? Is it a husband? Is it your wife? Is it your children? Or does Jesus have the top priority in your life? Are you more focused on your job, on, you know, other things in life, how to make money? Uh, does that take a priority in your mind? Or is your mind focused on God? Because, you know, everything that we want in life, if we seek first his kingdom, as it says in Matthew, guess what? It'll be added to us. Seek first God and his kingdom. Have a victorious minded, uh, have a victorious mindset. Second, we learn from um, Joshua and in life. Raise your hand if God has ever done something for you before. I can raise my hand high. Raise your hand if God has ever given you a victory over a situation. I can raise my hand high. And sometimes when we're facing a new challenge, 
we must rehearse and revisit the victories that God has already given us. Because guess what? If he did it once, he'll do it again. So if he gave you victory over a situation regarding finances where you needed to pay a bill and you didn't have the money, but all of a sudden, boom, somebody gives you the money for the bill. Remember that. If you needed a healing and God touched your body and healed you uh, by the stripes of Jesus, then you need to remember that. If you had some disorder or distress or stress or anxiety in your life, and God gave you peace and you see something's come, trying to anxiety trying to come back on you. Remember, God is a peacemaker. He'll give you peace that passes all understanding. He did it for you once. He'll give you peace again. You know, I, this is what I love about God. God is an abundant God. So if he gives you, if he does something once for you, that's not it. He doesn't check it off the list and say, okay. I, I helped Sharon with her finances once. That's it for her. No, God is a God of abundance. He can do it over and over again. He, he, he doesn't have a depletion of resources. He has plenty of resources and he'll do it over and over again. Amen? Amen. Amen. So rehearse those past victories. I spent a lot of time rehearsing past victories. You know what? Courage is usually connected to victory. If you go, one of the things I love, even going back in Joshua, the first chapter, it says, be strong and very courageous for the Lord your God is with you. Be strong and very courageous. Be strong and very courageous. You know, God gives us strength. We don't have strength in our own might. God is the one who will strengthen us through the power of the Holy Spirit and his word. When I get up in the morning and I have my quiet time and I read my Bible, it, the word of God gives me strength to tackle each day. God gives me strength to tackle each day, but it's because I spend time with him. I connect to the power source. I connect to the power source. Listen, if you want strength, if you want courage, you got to connect to the person who has the strength and the courage. He said, I have not given you a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. If you don't have power, love, and a sound mind operating in your life, then you need to spend more time with God and his word. In his word. Listen, we're not perfect. We, we're, you know, we're not up, 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 up all the time, but you have to maintain a victorious mindset. You have to be a victorious minded believer. So you have to keep in your mind, God has already given me the victory. And then you reach out and receive it. You reach out and claim it. And you do that through his word. So remember, courage is often connected to victory. That means you might have to Step out of your normal place that you're used to doing things or your normal way that you, you are used to doing things. Step out in courage. And sometimes we don't even realize we're demonstrating courage. You know why? Because we're walking it out with the Lord and the Lord is synonymous to courage. If you walk it out with him, you'll be demonstrating courage and you don't even know it. Because it just becomes a part of the fabric of your life. And another key principle that we learned from Joshua in this passage, you have to value results more than your image and your reputation. I'm going to say that again. You have to keep your eyes on and you have to value the results, the outcome, more than the image and reputation. What do you mean by that? Well, remember... Joshua, a warrior, military guy, he used an unortho, unorthodox, non-traditional approach to this Jericho capture. Now, the people on the other side of the wall, they might have been laughing. <laughs> These people are marching around. <laughs> he could have been intimidated uh -oh, by what people think about him. 
That's, that's one of the biggest obstructions to having a victorious mindset. That's a big obstruction to becoming a victorious minded believer. Being concerned about the approval of others and what others think about you. If Joshua was concerned about what people thought about him and not about the results, he wouldn't have had that victory. He could have heard God say, march around the, um, march around seven times. And he could have said, well, I'm going to downsize that a little bit because, you know, these, everybody's out here watching us and stuff like that. So we'll, we'll just do it three times. We'll do it three times. Because, you know, the people are watching us. They probably think we're a little strange around here doing this march. No. Joshua did not waver. He kept his eye on the prize. And he was not concerned about his image or his reputation. And let's face it. Our image and reputation has to be couched in Christ. Christ is our life. Christ is our reputation. Our reputation is in Christ. It's in him that we live and move and have our very existence and being. And so we have to value the results more than the image. And you know what? At the end of the day, when we are victorious minded believers, when we embrace a victory, when we seize the victory that God has already prescribed for us, then guess what? It brings glory to God. Your victory brings glory to God. Your victory brings glory to God, especially if you give him the glory, the praise, and the honor. You know, in closing, let me say this. I, um, I have been blessed over the years um, to be a, a leader. And, and God has, uh, has given me a number of victories on this path. But guess what? I know that nothing that happens, nothing that I do, is about Sharon Weston Broom. Mm -mm. It's all about his kingdom agenda and bringing glory to him. And so there may be times when people might not understand you. There may be times when uh, uh, you feel uh, the pressure to compromise your beliefs or your convictions. But remember, we are designed, we're created by an almighty God, the creator of the universe, created each and every one of us. And he wants us to have life and life more abundantly, which means you need to be a victorious minded believer. That's what God wants for us. He wants us to walk in the victory that he already preordained for us through the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So, let's have a word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you for this day that you've given us. This is the day that you've made and we're rejoicing and we're glad in it, Father. As uh, Pastor Drumgoal and Prophetess Drumgoal already stated, we have a lot to be thankful for. And Lord, we know that victory also is built on a foundation of gratitude and thankfulness. And so, Lord, we recognize what you did for us even this past weekend as it relates to the hurricane. You spared us, Lord, once again. And we're thankful and we're grateful. And show us, Lord, how we can uh, be a blessing to those that were impacted by the hurricane in our own individual and collective way. Lord, as I pray today, I pray for uh, my brothers and sisters who may be working towards gaining victory in a certain area of their lives. 
whether it's victory in their family, victory in their finances, whether it's victory in employment, victory over their mind and their thoughts. Lord, you've already said in your word, thanks be to God who has already given us the victory. Father, we recognize now more than ever before that the victory has already taken place and we must walk it out. We must believe in faith and we must receive that victory and make it a daily part of our lives as we seek you first, Lord, in your kingdom. Father, speak to our hearts um, individually and collectively, name by name, person by person, including me, Lord. Start with me as we do a self-check and evaluation of areas perhaps we that I need to be more obedient in or uh, rehearsing our past victories or making sure that you are the beginning and end of the focus of every area of our lives, Father. Lord, we thank you for victory in every area of our lives. We thank you, Lord, that our minds are transformed. They're renewed minds focused on victory. Victory is ours. Victory belongs to us, Father. And Lord, speak to our hearts in terms of what we can do even this day to embrace a victory mindset. And more importantly, Lord, help us to demonstrate your love and be a light to many who are lost and who need to know you, Father God. Lord, let us love without exception and unconditionally, knowing that that brings glory to you, Father. Father, we thank you for this opportunity. We rejoice in it. We are glad. And Father, we look forward to great reports from many people who have embraced a victorious mindset today. Thank you, Lord, for all of the, the victorious-minded believers. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat>